This video is on Empire of Ash, the upcoming Doom of Valyria prequel TV series to Game of Thrones. It was originally the conclusion section of a much longer video I made on The Freeholders Part 2, which ran over two hours, so I had to cut it up into smaller videos and release it that way. So, wrapping up here, I want to address a big question a lot of you might have. Why should we get invested in any of this when it's a foregone conclusion that Valyria and Zamatar will be destroyed? Everyone dies. That Valyria is destroyed in a massive volcanic explosion. Parts of the peninsula sink into the sea. Other parts are covered with lava and ash. It turns into this Mordor-like hellscape that is never resettled. People die simply trying to go there. They're never heard from again. All of the dragons are wiped out. And on top of that, we learned that in this, the two main settings, the primary settings that the story revolves around, are the political factions in Valyria and the political faction in Zamatar, the regional capital of the province in Sothorios, their fantasy Africa. That Zamatar is never resettled. It's this long-abandoned ruin centuries afterwards, this ruined city overgrown by the jungle. So both of these locations are destroyed. Everyone dies. Valyria is wiped out. This is obvious even to someone who isn't that familiar with the books who's just heard of Valyria blew up. Why are we watching this? Well, that is an obvious question, but thankfully I don't have to answer it on my own because it is addressed very well in the series Bible. I was shown the series Bible in some detail. And do you know what a white paper is? That It's got these internal manifestos, mission statement, mini-essays, more than one on various topics in it. So my contact was reading them off to me, you know, would show, look at what the title is, this one's on why should we be invested in this. And there's a couple of other ones. So they spell this out internally, and there's over 100 copies of the series Bible at this point to share around production, writers, everything. So this is a question that would come up for staff. Why are we being invested in this? And I think it's you know laying it out in advance that this is the kind of thing someone would be emphasizing to you in a behind-the-scenes production video during season one of this. Like, they know people will ask this. So when we're seeing promos for this, they will be very upfront with this reasoning, I think, because they lay it right out there. Two big points which I felt really answered it pretty succinctly and very well. The first point, and by the way, this isn't my speculation or I'm discerning this. This, this is their words from the series Bible. And I'm just relaying it to you. That It was stated very clearly. Point one is that let's turn this negative into a positive. Well, yeah, it blows up in the end, but that means we have a definitive end point to work towards. In, so that means that the story can't just meander off aimlessly and last season after season until it really should have been canceled long ago. That most TV shows shouldn't last ten seasons. You should stop and work on a different spin-off in that franchise. The exact words used to me, which I think were from the series Bible itself, were, this won't be lost season five that, well, just as uh, Game of Thrones, that you're working towards, since season one, the promise of the White Walkers are returning, they're going to attack the Wall. This is working towards their big, mythical, greater scope threat, is the Doom of Valyria is coming. So, they're working towards that. They've already outlined this is how it's going to happen and building towards it in the final season. They're not just making it up as they go along, but working towards a definitive end point and avoiding what TVTropes.com calls the Chris Carter effect. Uh, I'm using this term, but they compared it to Lost. It's just Chris Carter was the um, head writer on X-Files and just 
the later seasons of X-Files, where it's just dragging on, and you realize not just that it was past its due date, but you didn't plan out your central plot lines and mysteries. You are making it up as you go along, and it's just meandering with layer after layer. And a lot of shows have fallen into that, particularly with the rise of the internet and buzzworthy Twitter shows. Uh, in the mid-2000s, we had a, a lot of those. Lost is the first and greatest, with because it was on a network TV channel, with... They dragged it out longer than they intended and really didn't know where a lot of the mysteries were going. After that, uh, another big one, which I fell hard on, was Battlestar Galactica, the reboot of that, because it started with such promise, and eventually you realize they were just lying their asses off. Whenever it, If you made a show openly saying, I'm making it up as you go along, that is an art style, and I sympathize with that. But just the writers would keep boasting, we planned it out. We planned, I mean, very explicitly, we planned this out. There are central plot mysteries that we're building towards. And at the end, they admitted they were just plain lying. That I remember them boasting, really believing, this show can last for seven seasons. It can last for ten in their third season when they had completely run out of ideas. And it was obvious that they had run out of ideas. And the disconnect, they just didn't want it to end, and they just kept moving the goalposts rather than advance their plot lines. And the head writer even saying that during the, not the last season, but the series finale, he was frantically trying to retcon in an answer to all the central plot mysteries, because up until writing the series finale, he didn't know. And I think that audiences, genre audiences, were really wising up to that by the time Heroes came out, because again, Heroes Season 1 had such promise, and then they revealed, we didn't plan out any of the central plot mysteries, why are these people getting superpowers? So by later seasons, it just fell off, and by season four, what, even now there's people who are, you know, in denial, hanging on that the Battlestar Galactica finale was good, Lost made complete sense, and I, I know the Game of Thrones TV show with all of its changes is going to have people in denial like that, but Heroes, at least, by that, after being burned so many times in rapid succession by other shows, um, in the words of, I think, the Big Bang Theory, that there's a joke that you have to end these shows right, or be like Heroes, where it just drags on and on, and people gradually stop watching until they don't care anymore. So just, no one was watching Heroes by the end, that you're just meandering around, and it's not just that the quality declined, it's the audience gradually realized this is directionless. And it just the way the Battlestar writers are going, oh, this could last seven to ten years. Really? How many shows last that long? I mean, objectively, most shows don't last more than five to six years at best, nor should they. I mean, like, Breaking Bad was five seasons. That That is an upper limit. And you, you would stop and have a different spinoff, and you do it right. That's how long shows... That's what a good-sized show is. So, point one is just... It has a definitive end point, and it's not going to meander around aimlessly, but have focus that way. More or less, like, we don't know if anyone's going to survive Game of Thrones with the Long Night. What if everyone dies? What if there's no sequels or prequels? What does it matter if anyone lives or dies? So, that made sense of just working towards something. Also, minor update here, in the original leak, I phrased it as that it's planned to last five years. That is slightly inaccurate. The way the series Bible phrases it is that it is planned to run five to seven years. You see, we kept hearing conflicting reports from Game of Thrones about how many seasons they wanted it to run, uh, which I feel are totally the fault of the showrunners, that ultimately they said we only really wanted to give seven years of our lives to this. When Martin said, okay, it's going to be a seven-book series, hopefully, and the third one is so long we're splitting into two seasons, it should be at least eight seasons, preferably nine, because some of the later long, just mentally, and this isn't an abstraction, he's plotting out, oh, this is roughly how much material is in it, you'd have to cut out a ton of stuff, and or bring in a new generation of people, I don't know, but 
no, nine years for something of this scale is reasonable. And oh, so many characters die, it's not like that many actors would be doing that. That They just keep going, oh, well, you know, no one wants to be more than seven. Yes, because you split one book in half, it needs to be at least eight full seasons. Ultimately, they they split the last season in half, so it's seven and eight or two half seasons. It's not the same thing. That the Game of Thrones showrunners are always pushing for fewer seasons than Martin felt it could sustain. In contrast, basically, for, you know, everyone's saying, oh, this would cost so much money, the sets and the scale of Illyria. Five seasons is the bare minimum that they need to tell the story, but the series Bible itself says we hope to expand that to seven seasons. You know, the, the, the easier sell is for something of this expense and scale, five seasons at minimum, though if it's a hit, we can expand that to seven, and not just padding, I mean, there's things that they don't want to cut out that they can add in more detail on. And I'm not sure exactly how it'll reach from five to seven. Maybe, like, what would have been season five gets a, uh, you know, a season and a half order, so you get, you know, what Game of Thrones season seven did, so it gets split into two seasons when it gets split. Just what A Storm of Swords did, where the story for that one book, that one movement in this symphony is so big, we needed to split it across two seasons. We shall see, but no, five is the minimum. They were hoping to get seven seasons, which is a lot. And if people like it, which I really... It's the Dragon Show. It's going to be amazing. So their plan is five to seven seasons, ten episodes a year, most of the time. And they have an end point they're working towards, so it, this is all reasonably well planned out. They're not going to meander off like Lost Season 5. That is the warning they give. And that made me feel a lot better about it. But the real point I want to bring up is the second one is what really logically sold me on this, that made more sense. Why should we be invested in this if Valyria and Zamatar are destroyed? Why should the casual audience get invested in it if everyone dies? Not everyone dies in the Doom. This is like bolded in the series Bible. It's a chapter heading in the mission statement that this is not just me speculating. This was my source repeated this and hammered it home more than once to really emphasize it to me. Not everyone dies in the Doom. There's this whole essay in the series Bible. Like, people will be saying this in promos for season one of why sh you should get involved. They, they're they not stupid. They know how TV works. That they, they still want it to be water cooler TV. That people watch from one week to the next for the excitement of seeing if characters live or die. And they understand that some of those characters have to live for that to work. And that's not my phrasing either, that it says in the series Bible, water cooler TV. Buzzworthy TV that everyone's talking about at work the next day around the water cooler. That if you're in a casino where no one ever wins, what's the point? The excitement is one out of a hundred times at the slot machine you actually you could plausibly win. Some of them could and will plausibly live. It, it, it's just common sense and logical, and it spells it out right in the series Bible. People would not be invested in this if they think everyone's going to die. So, like, right up front, you get the sense that in season one, in promos, they, they'll be openly promising not necessarily everyone dies. Some of these characters, we promise, will live to the end of the TV series and beyond the Doom. And on top of that, you can't just go, well, they lived, but they crashed somewhere and lived as an isolated hermit on an island or a mountain or something. On top of just the characters living out their happy ending, they know it needs to have some impact on wider history, on wider geopolitical events for the world as a whole. 
in order to have stakes, narrative stakes. And this is all common sense. It's surprising to have people in charge with common sense now. It seems such an alien concept. That, well, for starters, think about it. If nothing else, we know that the Targaryens survive. They go to Dragonstone, off the coast of Westeros, and Dragonstone's going to be a setting in the show for a while, not just in the last five minutes. That They said it was one of the on-screen locations. So, if people ask, well, why does this matter? Valyria blows up. Well, not all the Dragon Lords die. The Targaryens survive. It's the origin story of House Targaryen and what shaped them. And in turn, they shaped Westeros through conquest a century later. They made the Iron Throne. This isn't like the detailed history of House Cod in the Iron Islands. This is House Targaryen. They ruled and unified Westeros. It is a massive impact on later history of what is their origin story and it, it shaping them and the events that impacted them. And I think that's going to be a major draw for this series is something returning viewers can identify with, as opposed to something set in the Summer Islands or Yee Tea entirely, that we don't know any of these people. It, it's, look, it's the Targaryen show. and They're not a prominent family when it starts, but they're in it. They said they're not the biggest Dragonlord family, but that is the through line. It's the Targaryen origin story, and they will live. And we knew that, but on the other hand, if you know, hey, here's Aenar Targaryen and his daughter Danis the Dreamer, and it's guaranteed they'll live, because we know they do, uh, to go to Dragonstone, that's not exciting either, that you know they have to survive. That a big part of it is just this whole essay going to be water cooler TV, there have to be some characters who live but are under the threat of dying. But a few have to live to make it worth it. Otherwise, like a casino where you never win, no one would watch. Ultimately, the Targaryens are the only dragon lords who survive. It says a few lived for a year or two after the Doom, because just luck of the draw, not everyone was in Valyria at the time. Orion was a dragon lord who was in Quohor at the time, but he decided to go back at the head of an army with his dragon to try to rescue people and was never heard from again. They just disappeared. This Valyria turned into a hellscape. But there's still what, in a prior video, I called the retainer houses, the their version of landed knights, like the Valarians and the Keltigars, the minor nobility who don't have dragons, but are their stewards and generals, that a lot of them could plausibly live. I'm thinking like the Sphinx's equivalent of the Valarians could plausibly survive and like become the old blood of Volantis, if there's one family of characters we're following there, or something like that. The people aligned with the Sphinxes and the Young Dragons. Ultimately, though, the Targaryens are the only dragon lords who survive. We knew that going in, that any other dragon lord families they introduce, they're going to be wiped out. But... There are more characters than just the Dragon Lords, or even their immediate retainers. The Freeholders, this entire faction, don't have that limitation that all the other Dragon Lords must be dead by the end. They're not, and they don't live in the city of Valyria. The Free Cities, all the different Free Cities, everywhere in Slaver's Bay, all these other provinces, they survive. We know they will. Looking at a map here, just the vast expanse of the freehold across all of Essos, the half they control, the other half that they're influencing, in terms of historical events, this shapes all of the rest of the history of this entire continent. To use my hypothetical example character from my prior video, this isn't something they told me. I was just brainstorming. This is what the different free cities are like. This is a type of character I'd like to see. Uh, I said, for example, you could have the lead envoy from Mir in the Freeholders Alliance who comes to meet at their council in Zamatar. Well, ethnically, Mirish people look like Dornishmen. They look Roinar because of settlement patterns or something. So, Mirish people would be played by Latino actors. That this would you could have 
a woman who's ethnically a Latina actress playing the powerful head of a craftsman's guild from Mir, like the people that make the crossbows. And by the way, this isn't an official character, but this is official artwork from the world book of this is a Mirish tradeswoman, it says. So you could introduce this cool, I'm the, it's like medieval Florence, I'm the head of the craftsman's guild from Mir, and if they introduce her in season one, well, we know that Mir survives. So you can be free to get invested in that character knowing that she has a chance of living out a full life beyond the Doom. And that's all any of them have a chance in Game of Thrones. I mean, it's plausible that everyone introduced in Season 1 could die before the end of the show. It's possible that many of them could live. It's possible one could live. I mean, how many people in Game of Thrones lived from start to finish? It's Why did people like and get so emotionally invested in Renly or Cal Drogo, you know, characters who didn't live all the way through and we knew wouldn't live all the way through before season one even started. But you get invested because there's a chance they could. So they're worried about this and already worked out warning everyone in advance in case you're going into season one going, why should I care about any of these people? They're all a dead man walking. They, they really hammered it home to me in the series Bible. Quite a few characters live who are not Targaryens. Just besides the Targaryens, quite a few characters live. And from the way they're distributing, just the other two are Dragonlord factions. The Dragonlords don't survive. The Freeholders are the faction that will probably have the most surviving characters. By number, if not importance. Just all of the different merchant guilds, and a lot of them will die. A lot of them might survive... Characters we get attached to who are like the envoy from Mir and go on to become big figures in the ensuing century of blood that after Valyria blew up, uh, all of its provinces tore themselves apart in civil wars. It was the formative period of the free cities where they all declared their independence from each other. So you might see this person become the Prince of Pentos or one of the Magisters of Mir. And we'll find out in, like, a later book, Martin might name drop, oh yeah, they were like Triana of Volantis, they were this historical figure that everyone knows who that is, uh, from a a couple hundred years ago. So, they made it very clear, so many characters live, you would be surprised, but anyone who knows the history well, oh, they're, they're a historical figure in the Free Cities. The Free Cities survive, and that's enough to keep me invested. As for the, but the most prominent freeholder characters are nonetheless based in Zamatar. And we do know that Zamatar is left in ruins at some point between this and the time of A Song of Ice and Fire in the War of the Five Kings, in this 400 year gap. But unlike with the Valyrians, that's just the city, Zamatar, not its characters. You know, Valyria has the restriction, Valyria and its dragon lords were destroyed. But the fates of the lead freeholder point of view characters in Zamatar, like the matronly Asian woman, they're not set in stone. Maybe all of the lead characters took the last ship out to Volantis right before the Doom hit. Or like, if Star Wars was in chronological order, so you saw Rogue One before A New Hope, and someone told you Alderaan is going to be destroyed by the Death Star, you'd be going, why should I get emotionally invested in Princess Leia of Alderaan? I heard that leak that Alderaan is going to blow up. Well, yeah, she's from Alderaan, but she wasn't on Alderaan at the time. <laughs> That when the Doom hits, and I, I think Zamatar is going to be destroyed by tsunamis, maybe they were visiting the other Freeholders on campaign or something. I mean, a couple of Dragon Lords, like Orion, just survived because they happened to not be in Valyria at the time. Same thing has happened to him, could have happened to some of the lead Freeholders. And for all we know, she goes on to become like a prominent leader in Tyrosh or Volantis or a couple of other possibilities. So 
the setting Zamatar is destroyed, we don't know if these characters will live or die. She could live. I'm not really sure. The possibility of life and the risk of death being restored means this has stakes. That the plot armor of either plot armor goes both ways of you know foregone conclusion of we know all these characters are going to die, what's the point? Or the plot armor around Anar Targaryen and his daughter of we know the Targaryens will live. A lot of people were complaining in Game of Thrones Season 7 of, you know, we can tell Daenerys and Jon Snow aren't going to die during the White Hunt, and the, the word that kept going around was the stakes have disappeared. There aren't really stakes to this. That Despite all of this spectacle, even in the script, they were using the term red shirt for the random wildlings they were killing off who had no dialogue. They're just, oh, these are a bunch of red shirts. Well, then people aren't emotionally invested in them. So they will build up characters so when they die you feel bad and when they live you're elated. And just this is, it's just common sense, the right way to run a show. And I'm really looking forward to it. So talking about these characters, this is the end of what was originally the Freeholders Part 2. And after this I'm going to post up Freeholders Part 3, which is just one 20 to 30 minute video specifically analyzing the Freeholders POV character.